case. Who could look at me? Cases where there's might as well. All right. Hello, Tiff hello everybody. <laughs> this is Tiffany with the Speak Up and Inspire series. Um, we had some technical difficulties. We are now up and live. We are doing our author showcase tonight with several authors, um, many of them friends, many of them new friends. And I'm really, really excited to share this platform with you to make sure that we put the spotlight on a lot of our self, um, self-published authors, our indie authors, and our new authors. We have have a great panel tonight of authors. Um, we have two gentlemen with us and we have some ladies with us. Um, we have some authors that write children's books, who write uh, erotica, poetry, all kinds of things tonight. So I'm really, really excited to have everybody um, on the author showcase. This will be one of three showcases that we are going to be doing for 2021 and it's going into the new year. And so just really quickly, um, because we're behind because of the technical difficulties, I do want to let those that are watching know that there's going to be a chance for you to win um, free copies of the author's books tonight. Um, the books that are going to be available for um, free are going to be The Ripple Effect by C. Dwayne Hennett. How Special Are You? Well, You're One of a Kind by Miss Precious Pauling, one of my favorite children's books. Um, Marriage, Secrets, and Lovers by Belinda Houston. This is book two for Belinda Houston. This is book one, Take Off the Mask. Both of these books are juicy, 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 very, very intimate, very romantic. <laughs> packed with a lot of information, packed with a lot of suspense, you definitely want to get these books. Um, you also have my book as well, Reality Check, which is by me, little old me. And so we're going to be getting to know the authors on the, on the panel tonight, um, winning some free books, learning where you can get um, their books at, learning about the authors. And if you have any questions about the authors, please make sure that you put it in the comments. If you're interested in any of the books, that we have, please put the title of the book in the comments. So when I'm randomly picking winners for the free books, I can know what you're interested in. And also Life Through Poetry's Eyes by Tammy Thomas. So we're gonna jump right in because we're already behind. So if we go over a little bit, please bear with us, but please stay on with us because you're gonna miss out if you do not stay on the whole time. So we're gonna go ahead and jump right in again. Um, Miss Tammy, I'm gonna let you Get, get yourself back together since I had put you on blast last time. <laughs> and um, I'm going right. to go over to Miss Precious Pollen because I know Miss Precious is always ready to talk about her books. <laughs> so Miss Precious, this is your book that we have tonight is How Special Are You? Well, you're one of a kind. This is not your only accomplishment, young lady. So tell us about Miss Precious. Okay, so I often, I always like to start with my roles and titles. And so I'm a mom of five amazing young people. I have a 19-year-old, I have a 15-year-old, a 13-year-old, and those three are girls. And I have twin boys that are about to be 11 on the 15th. Mm -hmm. So I have five kids and I have a husband been married 18 years. Mm -hmm. Now that I told you my roles and titles, I want to let you know my mission and my purpose. My mission and my purpose is to help people find their switch. I think that we all go through life. We all are on assignment. My movement is I choose me, hashtag no more excuses, which is about us realizing that everything we've gone through, whoever we are, is about us figuring out that all of those valley moments lead us to our mountaintops so that we can share our light, our experiences, and recognize that it was all for us. And so it's about getting in relationship with yourself in order to be who you were called to be because your roles and titles are what you do but how you show up your impact your light that is the I am that is the God piece and so I like to soul coach mentor the soul into a good relationship so you can recognize that all of those things that you were going through is what makes you who you were created to be 
Very nice, very nice. Um, so how special are you? Well, you're one of a kind. What made you write this book? Oh, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> well, let's say I have 365 days of loving myself to of loving yourself to life. So this was the book that I wrote to teach women and girls, and it turned out being just souls to fall in love with themselves. And so I have five and made, you know, five kids, and I was a stay-at-home mom, and you know. I had dealt with molestation and I had dealt with different things. And I realized that a lot of times kids suffer in silence too. And what we have to recognize is that they come through us, they don't belong to us. And so it's our responsibility to be transparent so they can fly out the house. And so when I had the 365 and I was dealing with women and older souls, uh, my husband said something special about 365. He says it was a young girl's guy to uh, what is it, a seasons women's check back into reality and a young girl's guide to success. And so when I was doing that, I was like, well, imagine the little girl, that little girl that had been molested. I, I thought about her and I often saw a lot of people say, what would you go tell that little boy and girl? And what I found is that it is nothing to tell that little boy and girl. It is more to show up and inspire them. So I wanted to create a book that would inspire children, both girls and boys, because it's written in two editions, the same story. I wanted to inspire them to recognize that everything that they are going to go through is for the adult that they are becoming, that everything that they are going to go through is for who they are showing up to be. And so the how special are you where you're one of a kind is basically to allow them to see that they are a one of a kind design, that they cannot be duplicate because, um, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, so much has been going on in the world. So much they have been dealing with. So much they we have not actually seen their pain. You know, I think we are judgmental and not really realizing that they are going through a transition just as we had to do and that nobody is exempt from the molding process. So I wanted them to know that we see them, we hear them. And while we want to mentor their stomachs, we also need to mentor their souls. We need to feed the soul of who they are so that they can be who we are becoming. Wow. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I know that you um, wrote this book and you also wrote your three, um, 365. So I have, you have a, a pattern of your books and they're all very um, inspirational. They're all about self-love, um, self-care, um, embracing who you are as a person um, and so forth. Can you give us some background of where all this came from when it, when it comes to you personally? When it comes to me personally, that's why I said I realized um, the who may kill me, but the what will heal me. My mm. background is that I dealt with molestation. My background was that I had, you know, more responsibility than I thought that I needed. But as I grew up, I realized that that pain that that I was suffering in silence through was the very thing that equipped me. Like hindsight is twenty twenty, And so I know that the mom that I became was because of the overprotection that was created from me being molested. I know that the, uh, the friend that I became is because I can have the empathy in anybody's situation because I understand what it means to suffer in silence. So the I Choose Me was about identifying with self. Our motto is I pledge to embrace who I am today, love who I was yesterday, and inspire who I will become tomorrow. You know, the slogan is love grows everything, so love yourself first. All of it, I love that you said that, Tiffany, is a self-love initiative. Because until we show up for us, you know, the word says that treat your neighbor as you treat yourself. The problem is we haven't learned to treat ourselves right. We are pouring into people before we pour into ourselves. We are hiring ourselves for everybody else's dream before we believe into in who we are. So what I wanted to represent was that it doesn't matter what you came through. It is those reasons that you have a light to shine. It is for those those reasons that you have the spark you have something to give somebody in their darkness and I think that we are taking advantage and we are careless with our breath when we don't realize that your story is how you give God the glory that that shame is what allows you to stand in your lane that is actually designed for who you were created to be and so I figured if we would start with our kids 
they would not commit suicide because they would know that at the end of that situation, there was a light that would be shined for somebody. And so it's bigger than you. When I show up one time, then I get to multiply myself as many times as somebody shows up in a room. And when you realize that one is enough and you're just multiplication, you're intentional about how you are multiplying your impact in the world. So I think in this COVID, I realized I'm about to launch my new book, which is Awaken to the Infection That Is You, a COVID tip because we're all infecting each other with who we are and what we've been through. And if we don't recognize that that's what makes us stand up, that's what makes us one of a kind, that's what makes us perfect, we miss out on the whole story, which is after the crucifixion is a resurrected, a resurrection. So we can resurrect in these ways by sharing our light through our experiences, then we become the gift that we were meant to be, which is being present. And that's what I want our kids to be present. Very, very nice. Very nice. Very true. Um, when you take this book and um, say you read it to your kids or you're out in the community and you read this book, what kind of responses are you getting from the children? Oh, my goodness. Oh, I, I got it. My husband was reminding. Don't forget to tell them you have the QR code on the back. Well, oh, the <laughs> allows them to read now I can read to anybody's kids mm -hmm. because on the back the QR code is the audio of me reading the book so people are getting them as baby shower gifts it was something that was so cute I went to visit one of my friends baby and I haven't seen it, it was pandemic it was six months later and she had grown and when I came in and I started speaking she was trying to leap out of her arms and I was like wow she <laughs> loves me I'm not having no babies no time soon but you know what I realized she said oh my god I played the recording so she immediately felt, you know, like she knew me because right. when my voice thing. And so, I, and I realized when people were, you call, I mean, when people were calling me, it was like, oh my goodness, my daughter loves this book. She reads this book. My son, one, one young girl told me that her son began to cry reading the book. Oh. He got to the page where it said that, uh, you're one of a kind that the world will be missing a piece without you. Mm -hmm. And she said, he began to cry. And she said, thank you for giving words that I didn't even know he needed. And so I just want to acknowledge that there were words that I needed that nobody knew. And I'm sure everybody with a story has a history of the time that they suffer in silence. And so mm -hmm. while we suffer in silence, I just wanted to create secret healing for everybody who don't have the courage to say me too yet. Very nice, very nice. Thank you so much for telling us about um, your books, about what, what your your mission and you know what motivates you. Because I think that's really important as authors that people understand where your writings come from. Um, because I feel that that's a way for your your readers to connect with you, but then also to really understand what it is that they're reading. So I really appreciate you sharing. I that. wanted to add one thing. Yes, I just launched my I See Me Academy which is an eight week course for the children. So it's okay. mentoring the soul from peer pressure to soul pressure. Now okay. I'm gonna put my link for that. But like I said, right now we're in early bird special until December 15th, but mm -hmm. it will be, they will get a t-shirt, they will get a book, they will get live coaching sessions. They will get one 30 minute one-on-one. -on -one. If you go to the site, you'll see all the details, but I'm telling you, it is worth every piece of investment because until we can renew their minds it don't matter what you put on their feet it don't matter what you put on their back if you want to create legacy you got to renew the mind of how they think about themselves and that that will give you a butterfly season yeah, understood. Understood. I love that. I love that. And I will definitely look at that. Um, please, when you get a chance, go ahead and type in the comments, the link to see everything that it is that you have to offer, um, as well as the Academy. And we're going to buckle back to you or we're going to buckle, probably not the right phrase, but we're going to come back to you. <laughs> so don't go anywhere. Okay. <laughs> All right. So next we're going to move on to Miss Tammy. You ready for me, Miss Tammy? Miss um, Tammy yeah. um, is from Virginia. Uh, she loves to write poetry since she's uh, was a teenager. She is not just a poetess. She is an author as well. Um, she released her first, first book, Emotional Soul of a Poetess in 2017. And now she has her new book, Life Through Poetry's Eyes. It is a collection of poetry. So to me, poetry is, has, is kind of um, something that is not as publicized and not as right. uh, 
read as much as it used to be. I used to love poetry. We learned poetry, yeah. school, how to write poetry, and poetry really has gotten away from us. So I'm really glad yeah. that you are writing these poetry books um, and sharing your poetry with us, Miss Tammy. So tell us, tell us about Tammy. What do we need to know as your readers? Well, as a teen, I started, uh, I'd say around 14 or 15, writing poetry. And it helped me through anxiety, depression, because around that age, um, you know, we have a lot of pressure you know, during school, friends and, and a lot of stuff, um, friends trying to get you into bad stuff and you're trying to, you know, stay away from it. But uh, poetry helped me a lot. And as times go past, I dropped it. And um, I picked it back up when around 2011, when I came on the scene of um, Facebook, and I started writing then and putting it out there. A lot of people liked it. Um, they asked if I was an uh, author. I said, no, was I interested? No, <laughs> yeah, that was all of it. <laughs> so um, I say around two, 2016, I met a young lady named um, Ellis, Ellie L. McClinn. Mm -hmm. And um, she talked to me about being an author. And I'm like, I don't know. I could give it a try. <laughs> <laughs> I started, I actually started putting poetry on her website and um, they got a lot of attention and she came back to me again like, hey, I know someone that um, that's a publisher. She has her own company and I think that you two should link up. I was like, okay, I'll give it a try. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and that's when I started talking to my publisher, Roger Williams, around 2016 and I, um, went from there and I did my first book and it's called, can you see it? Yes, Emotional Soul, Soul, of, a Soul of a Poet. Yes, in 2017, that's when I started. But um, I am from Virginia. I'm a single mother, grandmother, and I, was, I have you know two young ladies and one of them is up here as an author. <laughs> <laughs> Tea wallflower. <laughs> yes, I am loving it. The mother daughter duo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I, I just love writing. It helps me a lot. And I see that it helps others as well. So that's what I do my poetry for. Not just for me, it's for others also. Very nice, very nice. And I think that that is going to be the consensus of everybody tonight on the Author Showcase is that they, they're, they're writing to not only um, as therapy for themselves, but also to help other people. I do yeah. believe that that's the consensus for everybody on this panel tonight, which is what I, I really, really love about everybody tonight. Mm -hmm. um, you said that you started writing as a teenager um, to kind of open up and kind of for your own personal reasons. What right. led you to share the first time? Like, what was it your friend saying, you know, hey, you're a poetess, share? What actually got you to share your poetry with someone else otherwise than yourself? Actually, I didn't start sharing until I got back on, you know, got on Facebook. Okay. That's when it really started. Okay. Okay. Very and nice. Then, you know, a Very lot of nice. people liked it. Yeah. And they said that some of it was, you know, inspirational or they could relate. Mm -hmm. um, they loved it. So I kept on doing it. Good, good. Well, we are glad you did. We're glad you did. You. So um, I know that your first book was Emotional Soul for Poetess. Can you yes. share your favorite poem from that book? You want me to read one? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The, um, my favorite one was Beautiful Disaster. And it's, she is hot as the summer night. She commands attention when she enters the room. Her essence astounds them. Her aroma entices. Her hips sway of floetry as she dances like poetry. Who is this woman of mystery? Thank you. Mm, very nice, very nice, very nice. <laughs> now, I know that you have Emotional Soul for Poetess, and I love the cover, by the way. I wanted to, to, to say that to you when you just held it up. And then you wrote Life Through Poetry's Eyes. So did you notice your growth from the first book to the second book? And are the books different, very different, a little bit of different, or? Um, I think my second one, Life Through Poetry, I eyes is um, a little bit more different. It's more, um, 
I said I put more passion into it. Uh, I took my time and um, more um, positivity also in it. Got it, got it. And why do you think that is? What, what took place for you in the first book that made you, that m- made those positive changes for you for the second book? Is there anything that you'd like to share? Um, just as I grew more as an author and as a poet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very nice. Very you nice. You learn a lot more when, when you read your first book mm-hmm. and then when you started writing, you learn a little bit more about yourself. And that is true. Um, also life changes also. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I know you said that you were a single mom. Um, how did that play in, yeah. in your writing? How do your daughters feel about you being, because I, I want to say that you have a lot of erotica in your poetry, young lady, some pretty adult poetry. So how did your daughters feel about that when they were reading this book from Mama? How did they feel about Mama when they read this poetry? <laughs> they, they, um, well, I guess t flowers would tell you, but they proud of, they're proud of me. Good, good. Proud I'm proud of, of you me. too. Like, um, <laughs> Really? <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, really, mom? <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they saw a whole nother side of mama, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. We, I love it. I love it. Um, mm-hmm. I know as an author myself and many of us on the platform uh, tonight mm-hmm. are parents. And so um, I know that my son has read my book, which was is pretty deep. Um, and I know that Miss mm-hmm. uh, T yes, has read your book. Miss <laughs> um, Precious, I'm going to come back to you. How do your how do, how do your kids feel about your your books that you've written? <laughs> Oh, I said they love them. They right. listen, and and I'm good. Look, <laughs> they don't listen. They I don't I didn't do the erotica book yet. That's just in my in my in my inside book. <laughs> They'll be like, what? If they put the poem I wrote my husband, they would be like, not my mama. Right, right. How many of you are parents on here tonight? Pretty much everybody. Okay. All right. Nice. Very nice. Very nice. Well, I think it's really important that our kids, you know, read our books so they can get not only learn about us, you know, as individuals, because sometimes our kids only see us as parents. They don't see us as individuals outside of being as outside of being a parent. So, um, so that that's that's great. That's great. And I'm pretty sure that Miss T is very proud of you. Um, for writing your books. And now she's an author too. So I'm not sure which one came first, but we're about to find out. Um, Miss Tammy, can you um, choose a po- poem in your Life Through Poetry's Eyes? And I'm gonna come okay. back later for you to read it to us, okay? Okay. All right, nice. Um, Miss T, it's your turn, beautiful. How are you? I'm fine, how are you? I am doing amazing. I- I'm doing amazing. So we're going to ask that question. How do you feel about your mama being an author? How does that make you feel? (laughs) It's good um, to actually see her go through something. You know, some people say you can't do something so late in life. But to actually see her actually go and do it now made me say, okay, well, it's time for you to go through it too. You know, you want to do this for a long time. So, you know, push me to go and go ahead. You know, when I wait till I got ready to do it, like she didn't went on out there. So it motivated me to do my thing too. So I was proud of her. Good, good. Well, I'm glad that mom was a motivator for you. I know that um, my daughter and my son both um, like to write. And I've encouraged them to write oh. a book themselves. So um, I know that I'm definitely going to get them involved with Miss um, Precious um, Academy for Kids. I think that, that would be really yeah. great for um, for my daughter, especially. So um, yes, yeah. If we can get our, See, kids I was thinking the same thing because I was digging a lot of the stuff that she was saying. Mm-hmm. So I really want to invest in her books. I really do. Yes, I'm. I'm telling you, you're not going to regret it. Um, have adding those books to your your children's uh, um, 
to your children's books. Um, it's excellent books. Um, I remember when she read it, I cried the first time that she read it because yeah. I it was a little girl in me that felt the words that she was saying. So definitely recommend I felt it. them while she was talking, <laughs> trust me. Nice, so <laughs> nice. Okay, so tell us about your book, young lady. Well, my book is a, like, like I always say, I remember with a splash of mystery. Um, it's really, it's a lot of things that some of us in different areas may see or go through, but it's about a, a young 16 year old girl. She's cute. She thinks she got it all. She <laughs> out there trying to get money. She see a little come up, but then she gets caught up in something she has no business. And um, there, I mean, just a lot of stuff comes from different angles, her friends. It's just a whole bunch of stuff that nobody knows is connected. Mm -hmm. And so as the story progresses, and it's being told from everybody's point of view, different situations, it's flip-flopping. So nobody knows what's going on until, you know, the very end, it starts to buckle down. Mm -hmm. But even then, I'm trying to tell you, you just don't know what you're going to get. Okay. I don't know. Okay, so a lot of twists and turns. It sounds like it's probably a lot of suspense. <laughs> um, so we yes, have a beat. Yes, I see. So we have your, yeah. can you see your cover up right now on the screen? Yes, can I do look at it. it. And that's my sister. That's my sister on the cover. Oh, okay. I was about to ask you, is that you? Because I was looking at you and I'm looking at the cover. I'm like, mm, maybe it's not. Okay. <laughs> that's yep, that's Miss Tammy Thomas's other daughter. That's her. Okay. So it's, we have authors. We have the, the models on the covers and everything. It's a family business yes. going on over there. Very nice. I love it. I Thank love you. it. I love it. And who's the, the young man here? Is he family? He's a weightlifter from Louisiana and he fit perfectly for the character that she's dealing with in the book. So I had to jump on him. Nice. Very nice. Well, I love the co the cover. It lets it, it lets me know that it's going to be um, relatable. It's people that uh, yeah. most likely we can we can actually meet. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. so definitely personalize the book for me when I uh, saw the cover. Um, anything else in store for you? Are you writing another I'm book? I'm actually working on a second one regarding it. This is a trilogy. So I'm um, working one that I'm also trying to do a movie for it. So I'm trying to put everything together. And I'm also trying to get a, a book about my autobiography. I'm trying to get that together as well. Um, it's a lot of stuff that I've been going through and I'm just trying to really piece it all together and say, okay, you know, you, you don't, you know, you don't have nothing, you don't care about holding nothing back. So now you ready, you want to tell the world, go ahead. So now I just got to really push myself to do that. So all of this stuff is really in the works. So got to watch out 2021, you don't pop out there. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, I'm reading your bio right now, and I saw where it says that T prides herself on being 100% real, yep. honest, and open do. with everything she does. Um, I do. Are we going to see that in the book? Are we going to see some real raw yes. emotion? Everything. Everything. Gotcha. everything from top to bottom. You're going to see it all. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. If we could put your book in a genre, where would it be? Oh, honestly, I can't pick. I can't pick at all. I, I would stick with urban because it is urban. You know, it's urban fiction. But uh, I don't even think I should have picked that. <laughs> it's real. I mean, it's real at the same time because you can you can just say you can sit down and say, hey, I've seen this. I just want to do that. I mean, hey. I don't even know. I'll let the I'll let the people decide. Gotcha. Um, another thing in your bio that um, reminds me of your mom. It says that you always knew your talents and your creative mind would take you to high places, but the dreaming stopped when things began to tear your world apart so early. And one day, you figured out that there was no reason to cry about it anymore, and why not just tell somebody. I like yeah. that. I like that. That that has a lot behind it. Can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Um, I mean, oh, 
I just it's just a lot. I think I've gone through, I mean, you know, normal or not normal, but stuff that other people have. But it's stuff that I've gone through and you'll probably just be like, how, why are you still here? And I mean, it's people around me that know about it. I don't mind talking about it just out here. But I think I've gone through stuff that is just, I don't think nobody should have to go through. So now it may be somebody out there in my situation or that was in my situation. I need to know how to get through it. And I think I need to help with that. Understood. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. Thank you so much. When can we look forward to your next project? Um, I would say at least by April, by my birthday, April 4th. Um, the, the first one, it was pretty... This one is raw. It was kind of, I wouldn't say rushed because it wasn't, it just has a little few ticks in it. Mm -hmm. This one I want to do better and I'm going to, you know, take my time with it a little bit more and make sure I cross all my T's and dot my I's. So the first one was like a learning process and now this one I'm really buckling down and getting together. So I'll say by April 4th. Very nice. Very nice. And I believe your mom, um, she was saying the same thing that she felt the growth between books. I know Miss Precious, she I'm sure will agree with that as well, that she yeah. had growth between books. Um, I'm sure everybody can agree. So we look forward to seeing your next project. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Karen. You're welcome. All righty. Let's see who we're going to go to next. So we're going to talk to, I'm trying to see if I can kind of stay in the same realm here. Let me see. Um, we're going to talk to one of the men. What about you, Mr. Dion? How are you doing tonight? <laughs> I'm, I'm doing great. Good. Now, I do not know you. Mr. Dwayne um, introduced me to you. Um, I know Dwayne. And so I trust when he said, you want to talk to this guy, that I want to talk to this guy. So Mr. Dion, tell me about you. What do we need to know as your reader? Well, um, it starts a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a father, uh, domestic violence advocate. Uh, I I just learned something new Dwayne is too as well. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm a founder of a nonprofit. I run a nonprofit mentorship for um, young black males um, from 13 to 19, uh, where we teach uh, conflict resolution, personal development, and economic education. Right. Um, so to say all that, I haven't always been that person. <laughs> so, okay we learn from experience <laughs> you know, we learn from experience but um it's uh my 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 upbringing was uh i would say kind of typical um urban upbringing mm -hmm. um no mother or father in the house uh i was raised by my grandmother and you know, just uh, live the live the life uh, with no structure, and I was my own destruction. Uh, so, you know, I became an alcoholic at 13, um, drinking every day. Um, by my mid 20s, in and out of mental institutions, uh, and I just wrote uh, the book to so. Um, People wouldn't give up like women and uh, family members wouldn't give up on the person that they feel like there's no help for. So right. um, I did it in hopes of just to uh, inspire someone just to take that one step to try to help someone instead of talk down. Got it. Got it. I love that. Um, you're sharing your experience and I appreciate you being open about it because um, mental health, um, substance abuse, uh, living in a single parent home or, or being you know, raised by someone otherwise and your, your parents, those are really serious issues um, in our community right now. And so you willing to share that, that with us, um, especially live to everyone that's watching is very commendable. And I appreciate that. Um, 
you said that you were raised by your grandma and I, you know, whether you want to share or not, but I'm the one that I'm always going to ask the questions and it's up to you if you want to answer them. <laughs> so you said that you were raised by your grandma. Um, is there a reason why you weren't with your parents and how did that affect you growing up? Because it sounds like it did affect you, but I, I would like to hear from you. <laughs> hey, um, FYI, I'm, I'm very transparent. It's all in the book. Okay, <laughs> so, good. Well, this is going to be great. Because <laughs> I'm going to ask those questions. All right, nice. So, uh, yeah, so tell, tell us about that. Why were you with right, your um, mom? Well, my, um, my mother crossed over when I was four in an airplane crash. Oh, okay. And my, my father was like a hit or miss. Uh, but I'm thankful to know who he is. Um, because I, I realized that a lot of people don't. Uh, but my grandmother, she wasn't the nicest with words. Uh, she came from a whole different era. And I can only imagine raising a kid in your retirement age, mm. you know? So um, that's how I pretty much came up. Um, so I, I was always lost. I've never felt a part of anything because I had uh, four, I have four siblings. I'm the only one with a different father. So uh, at that age of four, they were snatched away from me. That was the only um, family I knew were my siblings and my mother up mm -hmm. until that age. Uh, so, um, and it's not like they went next door. They went over 300 miles away with their father. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and I have two other siblings by my father. Uh, so I never really, I've never really felt media. I never really felt alone. So I turned to um, alcohol and um, drugs to numb the pain, uh, which led to just a spiral out of control, drinking, and uh, which landed me in a mental institution. Mm -hmm. uh, so, like I said, throughout my twenties. Uh, my, my mid-20s, I was in and out of mental institutions. Um, and, and incarceration comes with that too. You don't make, I didn't make the best decisions when drinking. But you know the positive side to that, um, if I never experienced any of that, I wouldn't be able to uh, relate to the youth or uh, people who may be going through certain things. I wouldn't, because I can speak from experience. So when I tell someone it can get better, I really mean that it get better because I made it better uh, for myself. So um, by taking accountability and not blaming the fact that uh, the, poor, the poor me story that my mother had passed, father wasn't there. You know, I was raised by my grandmother and I came up poor. I just used that all for um, motivation you know, cause I didn't get, I didn't even, I, um, I didn't get my GED until I was uh, in my late twenties. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And then, you know, I went to college. Uh, I mean, you know, I went to school. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's never too late. And now I run my own organization. So um, anything's possible. So that's what my book is, a book of hope for the unheard and the unseen. Let them know that it's not over. Yes, yes. I love it. I love it. We have a um, a podcast coming up with it all. It's a, a panel for um, those who have been um, incarcerated who now have organizations or community leaders and so forth. I would love for you to be on that podcast. It's on January 25th. So we, I definitely am going to talk to you about that. Um, I'm about to talk to you about a whole bunch of opportunities, young man. <laughs> Um, I well, love I don't to... affect... Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, um, I, I'm a designer as well. Uh, okay. Yeah, so I have a I have a line. I do a lot of shows. Uh, Very so nice. you know, it, there's no limitations to uh, what you where you come from. That doesn't determine where you can go. 
Very nice, Faith. I like that. I like it. I like it. Um, I think it's really important, especially in the community and with our youths, for um, men to be involved. There's been studies done that when men are volunteering in the community and when men are present in the community, that the youths respond better. Um, so I'm really proud of you for um, turning your life around, um, recognizing that you needed the help, getting the help that you needed, starting an organization to help other youths so that they don't have to repeat that cycle that you did um and then you wrote a book so tell us about your book a book is entitled um Faye is not an option i didn't get you a copy copy right away okay. but this is, okay. this is i'll, I'll bug books. you later for a copy <laughs> all right um but um Faye is not an option it's, it's pretty much self-explanatory i discuss um my upbringing, and I and I give real life uh, situations that had happened um, to me, uh, but I don't just talk about the the negative. See, in a lot of literature I hear um, from, like a lot of black males, uh, urban literature I hear about glamorizing drug dealing and you know the life of crime, and I felt it was my duty to do something different because there's a dark side to everything. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we always talk about how we're balling, but we never talk about how we're broken in jail. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> and I don't have lawyer fees. So, um, you know, but the fight is the fight is like uphill. So I just um, just give just different stories and they're all real stories. Some of them may seem <laughs> not so true, but uh, they are they are really stories in it. I guess you could call it a testimony in a uh, in a guidebook for the people that feel forgotten. Got it, got it. Um, I have your cover up right now. Um, Failure is not an option. It says hardship and obstacles are the foundation of success. Um, okay. What could you say or what could you share with us was your hardest obstacle that you had to overcome? Taking accountability. That was that was one of the hardest obstacles I had was looking at myself in the mirror and realizing that I caused the pain to myself. So I guess I keep on talking. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, and and alcohol, alcohol was a a, a big obstacle. Um, because I had been drinking since 13. That was my self-medication. I'm sorry, y'all. I had to, had an emergency at the door. Um, so accountability, that's a big thing. Um, when it comes to accountability, um, especially with what you um, had to overcome, the obstacles that you had to deal with, a lot of times people get in their, in the way, their own way because they're not willing to take accountability for their own actions, their own decisions, their own choices. So when it comes to accountability, what do you talk to your youths about to help them understand that this is an important step? Well, I'd be completely transparent and honest with them. I have this thing on my desk when they come in my um, office. Uh, it's the book of shame. Mm. So in that book of shame, I have like my deal, my Department of Corrections picture and me in the slammer and just different things and just to show them that there's no way you're gonna beat the system. Right. And that once they're out in the world, no one's gonna feel sorry for them for making the mistakes. Right. You know, and a lot of the black, you know, it's a lot of the young black youth. That's 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 my talk. That's just what it is. Mm -hmm. Um at risk um, African American uh, males. So um, just, you know, it's like an uphill battle for them. And I really feel bad because they have, there's so much against them. Um, you have the, the uh, music industry against them. You have the media, you have the video games, you have a whole society that's against them. Um, and I just be transparent with them. You can go left or you can go right. Now, right, you know that that I mean, you want to take care of your family. You like 
nice clothes, you like nice things, you can still obtain that. It may take a little longer to get it, but if you, what you do now affects your future. Very because true. I can speak from experience because all the things I didn't do, I had to turn around and do um, as an adult. Right, yeah. right. Very nice. Thank you for sharing that. Um, thank you for sharing your personal story too. I think that is very commendable for you to to be so transparent and to share so much um, because some people might be ashamed or embarrassed or um, just don't feel that they will have a platform to really tell their story and make a difference. And everybody on this showcase tonight has a voice and they've been using it um, to, to enhance the community, to be leaders in the community um, as survivors, to help other victims. Um, so I really, really want to applaud you, Mr. Dion, for, um, for stepping up, um, doing the right thing with your life, and then helping others do the right thing as well and to be able to reach their goals. So I truly, truly appreciate you sharing Thanks your story with us tonight. You will be hearing from me and I, Ms. Dwayne will tell you if I if there's any opportunities for me to network with someone, I'm gonna do it, so. <laughs> well, I can, I can share my story because I'm a man. I know who I am, you know, that yeah. don't define me. So, you yeah. know, that's why I like to be transparent. Yes. Because when I walk in the meetings and I'm the guy <laughs> that, you know, and a, a strange thing if I could, if, if I could uh, share it with you really sure. quick. Mm -hmm. um, the representative, um, he'll probably know it now, uh, Robert Reeves, we was on the same bill uh, uh, last year. And uh, <laughs> he was actually my attorney like 15 years prior. And he didn't <laughs> even realize it. But you know, that's just a blessing how things are. Right. You know, colleagues, from colleagues to represent someone. Right. It you took know, a whole so, 360, huh? <laughs> yeah, that's how I could be transparent. I'm a man first and I know who I am. Right. I stand on principles. So yeah. very nice. Very nice. I like it. I like it. I like it. Um, okay. Well, we're gonna keep moving. We're gonna keep moving. Um, let's talk to Miss Nicole. You're looking like you're ready there. <laughs> hello, Miss Nicole. And then next, we're going to hello, get hello. Um, to Miss April. So, Miss Nicole, tell us about Miss Nicole. I love myself some Miss Nicole. Hello. Hi, Miss Nicole. <laughs> Hi. Hello. How are you doing hello. tonight? I am so fine. Hello. I am just me, unbiased, neutral, unapologetically me. And um, I've been through it all. I mean, I find myself so far with everybody in a little piece of me. And that's why I wrote my book, you know, because I've been through that alcoholism, molestation and abuse. And um, that's my deepest heart right now. So that's what uh, prompted me to write my book. So um, I'm a mother, divorced, raising three sons. Um, now, 27, 23, and 22. And I've met your sons. You have some great sons. They're um, out in the community, too, with you, um, helping other kids, other boys, other youths. Um, they're out there helping you advocate against domestic violence um, and sharing your story. And that's, that's really heartwarming to see your boys um, uh, out in the community with you. I think that's really important that they're supporting you. And I'm sure that 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 keeps you motivated too. Um, you know, your boys. I've met I've met one of your your sons. Um, he's he's a great man. He did a lot of good work uh, with BV, BVP kids. Um, so I, I want to applaud you on that one, Mama. You raised them boys right. <laughs> well, thank you. It wasn't easy, trust me. <laughs> thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. So I'm going to just read uh, a little bit. It says that on your bio, it says, after overcoming domestic violence and years spent writing her pain on paper, Nicole birthed her first book, A Butterfly Called Rainbow, Five Books of Poetic Healing. Tell us about that book. Well, that book is Five Books of Poetic Healing. It starts with searching for what, what is love. Actually, it started from the poem that I stemmed that I wrote about domestic violence. And a young lady, she said, came up to me one day and she said, 
well, how did you know? And I said, how did you know what? And she said, that's my story. Do you have that on paper? And at that point, what she didn't know was that was my coming out moment where a young man that I was going to write in classes at the library and he kept instilling me, just, you know, just open up, go to open mic. And I shared it and this woman came to me. And once she came to me, it allowed me to reflect on my life, on all the things that I went through would allow me to share that poem. Because to me, that poem was a release of what happened or what I went through, what I had to endure. And by me sharing it, it, it just a little by little, all the, the scales started coming off and I started feeling free. And when she said that, I said, wow, I never thought about having it on paper. And when I went back to look, I realized that all the poems that I had hidden so far was telling a story on my life because every time I, I hid myself for so long and writing these poems and keeping them up, cobwebs and all, and for her to say that, so I started a one book, you know, typing it up on Word, two books, three books, five books, little books, just to see how it looked. And all of a sudden I realized it was a novel, over 107 poems. And it's just not a book of poetry that you just read a poem and that's it. Every poem that you read, it tells a story to the next chapter. And like the first book is what is love? Because we search for love in the wrong places and through the things that we love so much. It could be so much. And yes, I do have some erotica poetry in there also because <laughs> love is everything. It's lust, happiness, whatever you perceive love to be in your eyes, everybody perceive it differently. And then searching for love in the wrong places and, and, and finding love then after all that baggage, because now we don't search for love in all these wrong places, then here comes the baggage, the, um, the, the pain, the spiritual, mental, the emotional, the physical, you're not alone. It talked with all that baggage talks about molestation, child abuse, addictions, domestic violence, racism, everything that you go on, not just my story, his story, her story. And that's when I realized I wasn't alone. And then after searching for that, it's the strength of books of poetic healing, the third book. And it's the spiritual, the mental, the physical and emotional, because we all go through all these things and searching for love in the wrong places. Now here comes all this baggage. Now we're searching to find ourselves in each way because we are mentally torn down, physically torn down, spiritually torn down, emotionally torn down and ran down that we don't know which way to go. And then here comes God's resolution in the fourth book. It's God's resolution, unconditional love. And it shows us about trying to love God because now we're at the point where we could have, that mental issue that we could have had, that could have allowed us to commit suicide. You know, all that we endured. And, and after that, then, we have nowhere left to turn to God and realize that he loved us, that he picked us up. He allowed us to still wake up. And once I found that, then I found me again and I learned to love. And then the fifth book, the language of love, learning to love myself all over again, recognizing because all that baggage I went through, when I found that love, I thought it was me, but it really wasn't me. It was what was in me that some people cannot handle. So I had to accept that, learn to love myself over again and stop beating myself over the head and be the woman that God needs to be. In the end, I believe there'll be another chapter that we, he will find that love if it was meant to be. Very nice, very nice, Miss Nicole. I think that's the first time you broke down the book for me, um, but I'm glad that you did um, because I can definitely see um, some, some chapters in there that I would love to read. Um, cause I can tell you, and I don't know if anyone else agrees, but I, sometimes I have problem with self-love and, you know, uh, self-worth, self-esteem. Um, and I think that everybody goes through that in their lives, but when you've been a survivor of domestic violence and you've been a survivor of sexual assault and so many other traumas in your life, it's really hard sometimes to get back to, to, to loving yourself. Um, and that, that can be hard for some people. Um, and I know it was, it was hard for me. Um, 
but with with therapy counseling with me telling my story sharing my story it has really really helped me to come to love myself again and really really love tiffany and who tiffany is um and i know you miss miss nicole you're always breathing in um you know positive um affirmations for for others and even including yourself um so i really appreciate you breaking that down for us um i think it's important for us to know what this poem was that this young lady said that was her story. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, Can it you is. share it for us, Miss Nicole? <laughs> yes. You can buy me diamonds. You can buy me pearls. Take me on a cruise around the world. But just don't hit your girl. You can buy me diamonds. You can buy me pearls. Take me on a cruise around the world. But just don't hit your girl. He said, girl, I love you. I am going to make you my wife. I can't see myself being without you in my life. Fall into the trap of should be coming strong too fast, thinking that this newfound relationship was just destined to last charming me, loving me, captivating me with his smile, but not realizing his captivity is what he would keep me after a while. See, after the honeymoon was over, then jealousy stepped in. No matter how much I secluded myself, I just couldn't win, claiming that his blood, sweat, and tears is what it took to raise our family, but not realizing that those blood, sweat, and tears would be coming from me. Girl, I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. I won't do it again. I didn't mean to be so mean as he took from me more and more each day as he tried to get in between. By the time it was over, my body was used to inside and out. See, I conditioned myself to the point it was senseless for me to shout. I learned to shout on the inside, screaming, God, please help get me out. I kept hearing this voice saying, girl, you just got to leave. But he kept feeding me with those same lines, convincing me to believe. Girl, I love you. You are my wife. That if you ever leave me, I will take your life. You can buy me diamonds. You can buy me pearls, take me on a cruise around the world, but just don't hit your girl. He said, girl, I love you. I am going to make you my wife. I can't see myself being without you in my life. Thinking about my past, wonder he'd be the same as the last. How would I know if I don't give him a chance? Wow. He said he loved me. He didn't have to ask me to be his wife. If it was me, him, and a million men, I say yes to him anytime. Two of a kind, hearts intertwined, combined to death through us part, rich or poor. Even if I leave this earth before him, I still come in his dreams wanting him some more. He said, girl, I love you. Thank you for being my wife. I said, God, I love you. Thank you for saving my life. You can buy me diamonds. You can buy me pearls. Take me on a cruise around the world, but just don't hit your girl. Just don't hit your girl. And the theme from the song is no copyright infringement, but that's what I heard Alicia Keys' Women's <laughs> Worth when I wrote the poem. Yes, thank you so much, Miss Nicole. I take I take every opportunity for you to share your poem because it's so real. It's so raw. And I'm sure I saw Miss April. She was she was nodding her head and she was agreeing. Um, Miss, Miss April is a survivor too. So thank you so much for sharing your poem with us. Um, I know you you have, I'm sorry. I went away from your, you went away from your bio. Um, okay, yeah. So you have another book. Tell us about your second book before we move on. All right. So everything always led to one another. That poem led to me being somewhere else, leading me to a teacher seeing me. And I ended up working for the school district when I was living in New Jersey. So the other second book is called Quotes and Haikus Much Ado. So um, it started with one of the teachers. I was I became a teacher's assistant. And there was this um, a, a young lady. She was having problems, behavior disorder, such and such. But she was a poet secretly. So the teacher was like, Miss Williams, you know, you're a poet. I, I need you. 
And the girl came to me and gravitated, Hanifa, that's my baby. To this day, you know, she still stays in touch with me. So anyway, that led to me, they started realizing the effect that I had on her. And they said, well, why don't you open up a, um, a poetry club? So I had the poetry club. I used to work for the district in the middle school. And I started the poetry club. And then I started, I never knew, I never wrote quotes, haikus, alliterations, none of that. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes some of the poems, I didn't even know what it meant, you know, because I didn't study it. It just came to me. And um, it's that went one way and the kids started writing things and I started writing little quotes and messing with them. And it, it became that some of the poems you'll find, like one of my students is in there, my son, the one that you met, Markel, he's in there, did a compilation. And it's just, it's called sunrise because it's just something beautiful that with a short little words, a little quote, but means something big and powerful in an impactful way. And that's what I, I did. And very so, nice. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. I would love yeah. to read that, especially since yeah. we have some of the children in there writing too. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing, Miss Nicole. Thank you. You have touched a lot of people. I'm looking at the comments. They're like, wow, that was amazing. So forth and so on. So thank you again for singing for us, but also sharing your, your poetry with us. Um, that really lets us know where you come from. Thank you so much. Thank you. We are going to move on to Miss April. Hello, Miss April. How are you? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Duke. I'm doing well tonight. And the reason why I'm signing is because I think my deaf daughters are probably watching. So if my hands start flying, that's why. I have a few deaf uh, friends that might pop in here as well. So anyway. Very nice. Very nice. Well, I, we probably should have started off with you then. You could have signed for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> big old words coming out there too <laughs> yes thank you so much so we have your book here pinpoints of light escaping the abyss of abuse that is a pretty serious title miss april so yeah. tell us about you tell us who you are okay so i'll explain a little bit about myself my name is april tribe juke and tribe is my my middle name my maiden name so i truly am a tribe and <laughs> The, the tribe that I raise now, I have nine children, and my I have five boys, four girls, so boy team wins. <laughs> Raising my boys, I really have to watch, especially from the experiences that we had in that abyss of abuse. My first five children came from my first husband, and he suffered with intense schizophrenia and mental illness, along with addictions with, of drugs and alcohol. Because that was the easiest way to calm that part. Oh, did I say the word calm? Mm. No, no. For himself, he felt more calm. And it slowed down maybe two of the three personalities that would emerge. But yeah, it, it, was, a, it was a chase each night to try and figure out what the morning would, would be like. And my first three boys all have autism. So in the challenges that happen with, with those pieces... The, the first marriage was something as we continue to just think deeper into this abyss, the concept of light dimmed, 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 just like it does on a setting sun until you're in the middle of twilight and suddenly it's gone. Mm. So as I fumbled around within this darkness, I didn't know what I didn't know. I could survive come from generations of survivors in many different aspects. It was a very strong identity for myself and I was very proud of. Just someone asked me a question, wasn't I just tired of surviving and I didn't I want to thrive? That rocked me to the bottom core of my soul, stripped my identity stripped the last piece of hope that I had. Then, as I turned more towards my Heavenly Father, I knew he was there the whole time. And as I looked up, unfortunately, I just saw more darkness. Couldn't see a star, couldn't see a pinpoint of light, nothing. As the next day rolls around, we're going on nine years of, of marriage, five children, and we cycled, right? five cycles, hence why we have five children, 
where you'd start the cycle of getting dry, no drugs and alcohol anymore, starting off with doctors, looks like we're solving things, build the trust back, we're going to be having a kid, the stress builds, and off we go again. Mm -hmm. And the thing about the cycle is you never get back to where it started. Mm -hmm. So as you spiral down in that abyss, there isn't any hope. And it's amazing if you just wake up the next day. Well, one of those days, I had my first pinpoint of light. And that pinpoint came from, mm -hmm. from a source that was connected with autism that I never experienced or expected. And it was a simple phone call, simple in the sense of it's easy to make a phone call, right? Mm -hmm. And the words that were said to me were from a woman who I've never met. And she asked me to be a part of a school board and it was gonna be for a charter school to develop for autism. Uh, any students could arrive there, go there because it's charter, so it's public money, but the focus would be for kids on the autism spectrum. Mm -hmm. And as I was asked to be part of that board, I could hear myself saying yes. And then what I call my shame shadow, Jerry Vall experienced him. And that's mm -hmm. the name that he has for me. And doubt is the number one thing for me. Really? You? You can't keep anything together. You're part of a board? Really? Oh, that's interesting. You? Or did they say your name? Is that right? Again, it just never shut up. Mm -hmm. but I found myself going to these board meetings and contributing things. And I would sit back almost like an out of body experiencing, watching myself say things, do things, accept things and work on things, take action. And it, it was this spark of awakening. Oh yeah, I have skills. Oh yeah. I can be friends again. And I didn't use words like this, but I started to build a network I with that building of the network that was eventually how I was able to escape. But at that time it was just friends because the power of isolation, right? When you're isolated, they have all the control. That's true. So within that control, um, I then had to start really taking the creations of his stories and his schizophrenia and the people that were influencing his life that were in here and, never on the outside I had to be I had to make a decision to be a part of that story as my escape plan mm -hmm. where before I would constantly try to fight it and resist so I shifted positions with that and he felt that he had won so in winning he started to feel like he could build a little trust back because I describe abuse in two ways you're either the hunter or your caged animal. Many of us know and understand the hunters. They groom, they camouflage, they draw you in, they know their prey. Mm -hmm. And they know how to play. A caged animal has such paranoia, worry, fear, addiction, whatever it is that holds them and traps them. When you show up, they don't know if you are there to help them or to hurt them. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the strike out is abuse. Mm -hmm. and mine was the second, the latter. So within that, I had to start to construct stories, hence started my storytelling. And as I became part of his story within his mind, we were able to work in the fact that I didn't have to homeschool anymore, and that they could join this school, and that way they could be a part of the learning that he would always talk about, which was with the committee. Never a committee, <laughs> never anything like that. But in his mind, there was. So if I could be the liaison between the committee and helping the, the kids to learn, that was another piece of the end. I had to invent a lot of things and had to take down notes to remember the storyline, if we could remember it. Hmm. So one pinpoint led to another, to, to another, to another, and I started to see a little trail that I could escape and made, I made an exit plan 
the implementation of that plan was was not the way I thought it was going to execute, but that's okay. We never know exactly how it will go. But within eight minutes, I was able to get out. We were able to be free. And he chased us down for days, homeless. I don't recommend being homeless with five kids, especially with autism, because they like routine and stability. Mm -hmm. But I kept my job. And we showed up on time every day. And we stayed well past six. One person knew of our situation. And that person eventually saved my life again by giving us another place, a basement to, to stay until finally the apartment was ready for us to go into. Got a protective order, understood so many great things that I had no idea. Again, those pinpoints of light helped us out. In becoming free, I suddenly saw something that I hadn't really wanted to pay attention to before, which led into writing the second book, which you might talk a little bit about. But in Pinpoints, I knew that there was hope that you can get out, that you can escape. And now what we do is we put this book, there's 11,000 shelters in the United States all for domestic violence abuse and other housing supports for families and, and partial families. So we call it out for pinpoints across America. People get a free book and they go to their local area, local shelter, deliver it so that that light can be there because I know the survivors need hope. Mm -hmm. I, I needed not to know that there was a way beyond because once I had left I did not feel the world is open I'm free I can go forward I felt like I was always looking behind and I could never look straight ahead yeah until finally we discovered how that's pinpoints wow that is an amazing story um I'm kind of holding holding past, you know, back tears because um, I was just telling someone the other day that sometimes I still feel that even though I'm no longer with my abuser, I sometimes feel like I'm still dealing with abuse, mental abuse, a verbal abuse. Um, and so I'm, it, sometimes I have those triggers, which a lot of survivors do. Um, but I don't ever feel like I'm completely free of it until I, I stopped allowing the, the words, the, the phrases, the, the, the name calling and everything affect me as a person. I no longer let it, like if I had a wall up. So unless we were talking about the kids, whenever he would shoot things at me, it just bounced off the wall and back to him. And then I also realized that I couldn't let him know that his words were affecting me. I had to be strong and I had to tell him, you're not going to talk to me like that. You're not gonna disrespect me. I put up boundaries and I never let him get me to the point where he heard me cry or upset because that was the power. And I realized once I stopped reacting to him and letting him see my reaction to him that the verbal and the mental abuse slowed down. So I'm so proud that you had those pinpoints, that light, that you were able to follow that light to get out of that situation. I can't imagine being in that situation with five kids. I have two kids and it was hard. I can't imagine getting out of that situation with five kids. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, I know you mentioned the second book. What is the name of your second book? My second book is called out of darkness where you find fuel and live in your light i have everything about light because i know that we have the light of christ within us and it acts as the guide it acts as our ability to find our purpose our meaning what we're going to do where we're going and so like i had paused in the story once we were out free i had to understand well who am i now and 
what is the what are the next steps i know the immediacy i'm going to raise these children i'm going to do my best that way and yeah i'll gain more training and i will go out and speak and help anyone with autism i got that we're we're here and i'll just fill that in the gaps because then i don't have to look at, at myself mm -hmm. yeah placement behavior mm -hmm. yeah so i didn't go to drugs and alcohol never touched anything like that or placed with work let's work ourselves to some kind of numbness or free or whatever. And I know the power of work. I understand how to do that. I can function on four hours of sleep. No problem. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did. Now I had to look at that because they were actually three P's that I were drinking every single day, which was pleasing people, perfecting in anything I did, and then the performance. Mm -hmm. so, pleasing, perfecting, and performing, I thought, I'm covered, I'm good. Mm -hmm. That's a lie. Right. Amy, who sat there, never shut up. Mm -hmm. so I had a decision to make. I could look into the darkness behind me, or I could look towards light. Because when you're looking at light, a shadow will always be cast behind you, but that means light is always shining in front of you. So which way are you going to turn? I love that. Yeah, and that simply, I understood light right it gets so blunt i'm gonna look there and i never turn back that doesn't mean old shamey doesn't try <laughs> <laughs> he keeps going but he's gotten older and his voice isn't quite as shrill because i understand how to stay within god's light and how to move that forward so um, eventually I did, I did remarry and I had four more children. So my, my second husband, Scott, mm -hmm. he had never been married, was a bachelor, um, no prior children's, no prior relationships. He took us on, I mean, can you just hang on a second? Let's pause the story. <laughs> he wants to date someone with five kids, three with autism, cat. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're going to go ahead and give a clap for Mr. Scott there. Yeah. yeah. He was like, I am, and he stood up, stepped up, and stepped in. Wow. And I have to say something here. It's Christmas time, so I really have to say this. Oh, I wish I didn't have a scary voice. <laughs> <laughs> but those men out there, I have to say, who step in and who step up, there's no replacement. And I understand now one part of the nativity that I had never understood before. And that's of Joseph. Not much said about him. Kind, strong, and gentle. When I think about how he stepped in to raise the son of God. People who step, step in with love and by Joseph and I have to say you know it doesn't mean it's perfect or anything like that but it does mean there's love so now we have nine kids <laughs> and uh, with those nine children uh, number six was born deaf and that's why we sign number seven hearing number eight born deaf and has autism and number nine hearing so talk about different changing of family dynamics so with all of that we have a big move to texas from where we lived prior to because we needed more education more support and help for our, our deaf daughters and we took the opportunity and arrived on faith no home one job and the next day doors open because if you act on faith god will provide and he did wow. and after this second book all came about because I was still struggling with that pleasing, performing, and perfecting. Mm -hmm. And I was actually watching an interview with someone, and she shared a story, a birth story. I'm like, oh, birth stories, I'm in. Nine children, I got this. <laughs> I'm listening to her story, and she said as soon as her son was born and they handed him to her, she said, I just loved him. And I'm like, yeah, yeah you do love him. And then she said the words that broke me. And he hadn't done anything. Oh. Just here. And then I heard deep within, 
I've always loved you like that. Don't break me. <laughs> April, you're going to have us crying in here. <laughs> of course. Yes. You immediately, I had to go and face those demons well behind before I was even married because I too childhood sexual abuse from a neighbor I mean gosh I think Nicole you were saying how many pieces of the story do we have here I don't know how many hands we all have right and I had that I had to bring it forward had to push through the the eating disorder had to I mean it was a checklist and it was done through writing and as God gave me the words to write through it I did and all of a sudden this became the healing side where pinpoints is like the story you can't put down. It's strict story. There's no, and what I learned, nothing. It was a great story. I needed to be the storyteller. And in Out of Darkness, this is the opportunity through small stories and vignettes of this is how I've learned things. And now you can overcome too. And remember that there's always light. And as there's always light, there's a shadow behind you. But that means that you're here, you're alive and you're facing forward. So so move forward, fuel that light, put the good word in, say your prayers, connect with people who are amazing. Uh, Dion, I have to say the whole prevention is huge, massive for me because not all men abuse, but unfortunately 90% of abusers are men. Mm -hmm. I'm raising five boys. No. <laughs> How do we generationally break this and stop it? We have to heal the family. And the war that's on men is huge because I feel like men are not able to be vulnerable. They're not able to share because of the society controls and norms. And that's the punch through. And it's, it's so beautiful that you stand and you know who you are and you share. And that is the biggest piece of this prevention for me. And I connect with whatever shelter I can. And I ask them, what is your prevention? Because we all know triage, we all know the rescue, and it has to be there. And I'm good with that too. Wow, if we could prevent. I don't want to deliver to all 11,000 shelters my book. I want to cut those shelters in half because the families love each other again. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, April. I think you have a beautiful story and a beautiful testimony because, you know, when we're in the, the shelters and I think Nicole's been with me when I've said this, and I think maybe Precious has been with me um, when I've said this, is that there is love after domestic violence. There is love after sexual assault. There is love after child abuse and molestation. You can have that love with someone, a real healthy, mature, supportive love after all of those things um, and your testimony to that. And so many other people are testimony to that. And I really appreciate you sharing that with us. I really, really do. I really do. Thank you so much. Um, we are definitely over, but I'm not going to short change anyone because we have phenomenal people left. <laughs> so um, Mr. Dwayne, our second man and our last man on, on, the, on the panel tonight. How are you doing tonight? Sorry, I'm great. Good, good. Um, we we've been we we've done this before, Mr. Duane. <laughs> yes. Oh yeah. So you are the writer of the Ripple Effect. Tell us who Mr. Duane Hennett is. Who are you? Uh, we need to, what do we need to know about you? Sure. C. Duane Hennett is an author, an activist, and a professional speaker. I do um, advocate for homelessness, um, domestic violence um mental me mental health and human trafficking because i believe that uh, all those have a, a certain link um to it so that that i advocate for one um because they're all linked together very much so very much so now there was a couple of things that were said by miss april and miss and miss nicole that i want to come back to you about and you're shaking your head so you probably know what i'm talking about <laughs> yeah, there was a lot so, yeah there was a lot so i'm just going to go ahead and let you just touch on it um can you address miss nicole and some points she brought out and then we'll go to miss april and some points that she brought out because i can specifically 
go to the ripple effect and talk about some things that you said. So let's sure. just go ahead and start there. Sure. So start with Miss Nicole. So when she was reading her poem, and I started to think about the stories that I've I've heard from women who were dating certain kind of men, and the story seems alike because it feels like an abuser has the same kind of playbook. Um, it feels like an abuser has the same like if if the stories that I've heard, if you if if you listen to them, which made me become more you know become an advocate about it, is because I heard the stories. But the stories on who the person was kind of changed or, or, or was kind of similar. It was like they were doing. It was like some of the same uh, techniques and and, uh, and tactics they were using um, was always around the same. So when Miss Nicole was reading, I was shaking my head and I was like, "Yep, heard that before. Heard that before. Yep, yep, heard that before too." So it it was it was something that that you know as a as an abuser you you hear it and you feel it when someone else talks about it. Um, and as an advocate, you hear it and you feel it too, because like I said, those stories are, are similar. Everybody has some of the same kind of, you know, abuse that they went, th went through. And uh, for Miss April, uh, your story had a lot of things that I talk about in my book. Um, one of the lot of things that I talk about in my, well, one of the things that I talk about in my book is, is generational curses. Um, generational curses, and you said that there was one that you didn't that you didn't know about. Um, I talk, you know, when I do advocate and I do speak, and I tell I talk to other people about um, generational curses. Just because you don't see a generational curse, don't mean it's not in your family. Could have skipped the generation for you. So whenever whenever you choose a mate or choose somebody that you want to date or possibly have kids with, look very carefully on on their background and their history. Look very carefully on, you know, who the parents are and stuff like that. And two, whenever you're in a in a relationship and you think that you might be in a domestic violence relationship and you think that you might have children, think about that generational curse that you might be passing along to your children or your grandchildren or your grandchildren or your great grandchildren. Um, that's what I when I heard hers, I I I felt that as well when she was talking about it. Um, but those are some of the things that I, I, I talk about in my book too. Yes, sir. Um, something specific in your book that I want you to talk to us about, and I, I know you're going to smile as soon as I say it, because I ask you all the time, is tell us about the Dr. Jekyll and, and, and Mr. Hyde uh, um, comparison that you did in your book, because I think it's really important. So I do a comparison about Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, because that is the, psycho, that is the, the portion of the psychological or mental abuse portion of it, or mental health portion of it. Um, it talks about you. I, I do a, a comparison between Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde because Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, you know, he had d different personalities, and that's what kind of an abuser has. An abuser has kind of two different personalities. He'll show you uh, Mr. Hyde or, or Dr. Jekyll at certain points in time, but really, you know, um, Dr. Hyde is always the one that's been there. It's always been a facade. It's always been a trick. It's always been, you know, a mask um, that he's had. Um, and it, he does that to isolate, you know, the abuser, uh, the uh, the abuse, so that he can get him by himself, and the the full person who he is can come out. Right, right, very much so, very much so. What got you into advocating um, against domestic violence? Well, what really got me into advocating for domestic violence, I was actually on a, um, I was actually on a, um, a nonprofit as co-chair, and. It, um, through a job for the city of Durham. Um, I came to Durham, like I said, didn't have any experience with domestic violence, didn't see anything, um, didn't know exactly what domestic violence was. Um, through this job, like I said, we had cases that we had. We heard stories. I heard stories about domestic violence, um, you know, just by, you know, consuming so much of it. And then, you know, you see it on the news, you hear it on the radio, you see it on TV. It was like, this, this is really a, a, an issue, that, especially in my community, in, in the city that I lived in, it was, it was a real issue. It was, I mean, you would hear stories every day. Uh, and then the cases that we got, those weren't even the stories that even made the news. So it was like, I hear stories of people that want to come and tell me about it in a quiet kind of way. Those stories that I heard on TV were, were, weren't made the news. So it, it, it didn't match. So I would see that, you know, that um, the cases 
and the ripple effect that they had because a lot of the cases that they had dip, definitely had ripple effect where it affected the children, some of them where it affected the community where it was a murder or it was a, um, or the person got out and abused someone else. Again, it was a, a, a ripple effect as far as that. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, as an, a male advocate and, um, you know, Dion as well, if you want to speak on it, as a male advocate, how do you, have you seen how you being a male advocate has made a big impact in the community? I, um, I want to make a, let, let me say this, I want to make a big impact because just like, um, um, as Nicole said, 90, 90, 90 of, of male are abusers. So I want to be an impact in the community to show that there, there are men who do stand up against domestic violence, that even though that you've been abused and your abuser was a male, not all, all males are abusers. So there are some males, I want to be, I want to be that, the example. I want to be the exception to the rule that you might think or that you might feel in your heart that you, because like I said, we talk about generational curses. A lot of people who are abused kind of pick some, sometimes they pick the same kind of man. And sometimes they keep picking the same, the same man over and over again, maybe different people, but the same kind of man. So you're only ex, uh, exposed to abusive men or toxic relationships or unhealthy relationships. So the relationship that I have with you or, or the, uh, the example that I have with you, I want it to be totally different than what you're exposed to. Right, right. Yes, um, I, I definitely think it's, um, it, like I said with, with Dion, it makes a very big difference um, when you have a man that is advocating, um, especially in the community and especially when it comes to DV, because of the fact that the majority of reported cases, I'm saying reported, because there's so many cases that go unreported are um, uh, mm, the abusers are typically men. Um, but we also know that women can also be um, uh, abusers as well. Sorry, lost my train of thought. Um, so yes, so when it comes to being an advocate and you do uh, speaking engagements as well, uh, what, what, what's next for you? Or what is it that you are focusing on right now? Um, I'm focusing on more speaking engagements. I'm spoken. I'm focusing on working with different nonprofits to spread uh, prevention and, and awareness about it. Um, because it, it, like I said, I came to this as a novice. I actually wrote this book from a viewpoint as a novice. Um, the book is uh, is written from if you never knew anything about domestic violence and you picked up a book about domestic violence, then you would know how to help somebody that's in a domestic violence relationship or domestic violence situation. Um, it comes with an emergency plan that's in the back of it. So whenever someone comes to you and talk to you and say they need help or that, they, that you wanna express how to get them help, there's an emergency plan that you can go to um, because I talk about how that, um, if you don't know about a threat, how can you be aware of it? A lot, like I said, a lot of people don't know, you know, the ins and outs, the all because uh, domestic violence has, it's like an onion, has so many layers to it. Mm -hmm. So when you sit there and unravel one piece of it, there's another, there's another piece of it. And you sit there and unravel another one, there's another piece to it. Like this year, we started, last year when I started writing the book, by doing research, I found out about spiritual abuse, which I didn't even know even existed. Didn't even know it existed as as a form of domestic violence or a form of abuse. So, like I said, whenever as a novice you you pick up my book, you read it, you learn about isolation, you learn about like I said generational curses, you learn about how to fix children, you learn about how how uh, how to fix mental illness, or you learn about other mental illness. You learn about what a dangerous man looks like, a narcissist. You learn about things like gaslighting. You learn about fear, how fear is one of the major tactics that they use to keep an abuser in, in a relationship. You learn about financial abuse, how women won't leave because they are afraid that if they get out of there, just like April talked about being homeless, that they will be homeless. They will rather be back in their abusive home than to be homeless on the street with kids they, they can't feed or take care of or have a roof over their head. That's true. As, a, as a person, as a person or someone on the outside seeing that, 
when you ask the question, why don't you leave? That is the most insensitive question to an abused person. Very true. Why don't you leave? Well, why can't you leave? You sit there and you read through this book. It'll tell you why that's the most insensitive question that you can ask. Because there are so many reasons why, why people can't leave an abusive re relationship or toxic or a toxic relationship. Very true. Very true. Um, yes, I definitely... Um, can say that everything that you have mentioned are things that a lot of people have never even heard of, <laughs> number one. Um, and that really needs to need, there needs to be more education about the different forms of abuse because most people consider abuse when you're getting hit or you have a black eye or something mm -hmm. like that. They don't even think about, and I'm gonna be very candid, so I hope I don't offend anyone, that when a man calls a woman a whore or a bitch or whatever it is he calls her, that's a form of mental and verbal abuse. Um, you know, not letting her go to church, having a problem when she prays, throwing her Bible away, those are all- Keeping her pregnant. Yes, yes, keeping them pregnant, keeping them pregnant because that's another form of control and keeping them, you know, isolated and so forth and so on. There's so many different forms of abuse that people do not know. And so having the education and knowing what the different forms of abuse is important because there's so many different kinds. It's not just when you walk, when you have a black eye or you're being hit. Some, some things are, are deeper, the emotional, the verbal, the, the mental abuse, those, those things, uh, you know, a hit, a black eye, those things go away. Those words, those things hurt it hurts yeah. and they know it hurts and it, it, it breaks, it breaks a person down. And so I'm really glad that you brought that up, the spiritual abuse and just recognizing the different forms of abuse. Thank you so much, Mr. Dwayne. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. All righty. We're almost there. We're almost hey, can there. Can I read something from my book? <laughs> I'm sorry. I said, can I read something from my book? Oh yeah, sure. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> One of the things that I read from my book is, is well, one of the chapters that's in my book is called The Mist, it's chapter four. Mm -hmm. And it tells about, you know, and the reason why I call it The Mist is because it's the mental side of, of, of abuse. And it starts <laughs> off with, it all begins and ends in your mind. What you give power to has power over you, if you allow it. And it starts off, like I said, it's called The Mist. It says fear is the most important uh, tech that, that an abuser will use. Fear can be used as a blunt instrument, like a sledgehammer or something light as a feather. Both can have the same effects when it comes to the abuse. Fear can be can be used to paralyze the abuse from thinking of, of leaving. It's a mental it's a mental trap set to spring whenever they whenever there is a threat of physical violence. Fear also can be a mental prison for the abuse, confined by what she thinks the abuser will do next. It houses the victims' insecurities, self-esteem issues, and deepest darkest thoughts. Thank you. Um, all of your, your chapters, um, and I'm going to read them very quick. Chapter one, splash. Chapter two, wave. Chapter three, ripple. Chapter four, mist. Chapter five, flood. Chapter six, after the flood. And chapter seven, receding water. Um, very good book. It's, it's not a huge book. It's not a thick book. It's very to the point, it's very educational. Um, and you're definitely going to understand by the, as you read the chapters, what the ripple effect is. Very important book. I highly recommend it for new advocates, for men, for, for women that have boys, for, to have children, um, and just getting the male perspective. I really, really encourage everyone who wants to learn more about domestic violence to definitely pick up this book. Highly recommend it. Thank you, Mr. Duane. Thank you. Appreciate you. All right. We're almost there. Ms. Sheena, how are you doing? <laughs> You're on mute, baby. I'm good. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm do doing good, Ms. Sheena. Tell us about you. What do we need to know about you as an author? Well, I'm an author of two books. My first book is called The Mask Behind the Mask. The second book is called Unveil the Book of Pieces of a Mask. I'm originally from Cross, South Carolina. I now stay in Troy, New York. I'm a single mom with two beautiful girls. They are nine and 10. Um, I'm also a domestic violence advocate. 
And actually, I've been writing since I've been 12. And I decided to write my book in 2018 as my transformation after going through the messing while it's not once but twice and one from a guy and another from a girl. Oh, okay. That's a whole nother pers different perspective. Nice. We're, we're hitting on a lot of stuff tonight. A lot of stuff. Okay. So tell us what's the title of your first book and tell us about your first book. The first book is called Mask, The Mask Behind the Mask, and it's a book of poetry and spoken words that I put together for people to love all the imperfections despite what they're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Very nice. Um, what, it, what, 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 mm, what empowered you <laughs> to write your first book? <laughs> my first book empowered me was one, to give my kids a different vision after me going through domestic violence, but the title came because one, I dealt with domestic violence, you would never know if I don't tell you. And two, I deal with three different health conditions. So that was another mask I carry. I deal with fibromyalgia, which is the chronic nerve pain. I deal with ankylospinuitis, which is arthritis in my spine. It goes to the rest of my joints like rheumatoid arthritis. And I deal with a kidney disease called polycystic kidney disease. disease. So I use this title as a way to show people, regardless of what you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, regardless of what you've been through, you can take that mask off and be comfortable in your own skin, regardless of what the cards you were dealt with. Yeah, definitely. Um, I was uh, um, diagnosed with fibromyalgia myself. Um, I have chronic pain I've been dealing with for about seven years now. They still can't figure out what it is and gave me a diagnosis as fibromyalgia. I don't believe that that's the correct diagnosis, but they can't figure it out. So I definitely can understand, understand that. And it really does affect your life. Living in everyday constant pain um, really does affect your life. Um, what's the name of your second book? The second book is called Unveil the Pieces of a Broken Mask. And tell us about that. And with that is a spinoff of my first book. But this time I'm teaching people how to break all those pieces of hurt, baggage, depression, trust, uh, self-worth low self-esteem and all the et cetera and how to embrace yourself after the trauma. And that's important. That's important. After you get out of the situation, after you've left the domestic violence um, relationship, then you have to get all the pieces and get them back together, learn to love yourself again, learn to accept who you are, learn how to be accountable, like Mr. Dion said, um, and just really learning who you are all over again. Um, when writing these books, were these kind of a form of therapy for you? Or do you feel that you had you had healed and you needed to share it with others? How was that process for you? Um, well, when I was writing for them, I was actually going through the domestic violence. And I took it as I went and went through a program called Unity House out here. And as I went through the program to become a better version of myself after going through the trauma, I decided that if I use it to empower myself, why not take it to empower other people? Because a lot of times I've seen a lot of people when I went back to the shelters, they were stuck and they didn't know how to go to the next level or how to be happy again or how to, I still have these issues and I go to them and talk to them and understand that, listen, I still have the nightmares sometimes. I still go through triggers, but it's okay to say that you're not okay. It's okay to take that mask off and be comfortable in your own skin. Because at one point, I didn't want to talk about none of it. I didn't want to talk about my domestic violence. I didn't want to talk about my health conditions. I didn't want to talk about none of it. And eventually, I had to get comfortable and take the mask off. Yeah, yeah. Um, when as there's several advocates on here, um, myself, you, Miss Precious, uh, Dion, actually everybody on here is um, is advocates for some cause, um, and a few of us for um, domestic violence. And you know that that really is. I don't know about if everyone will agree with this, but the accountability piece with, um, you know, Dion said, you know, we all have to take responsibility somewhere in those abusive relationships that we, that we added, you know, that we took mm -hmm. on. We allowed ourselves to be in this relationship. We allowed ourselves to continue in a relationship. We allowed ourselves to have children in this relationship. Absolutely. We allowed ourselves to be in these relationships for nine, 10, 12 years, however long it is. Um, so that accountability piece, but then being able to say, you know what, I'm a victim. Let's talk about it, you know, and getting it out there so that you can start to heal. You can't heal if you don't recognize that you're, you take accountability that you are a victim and that you need to tell someone and you need to do something.
So um, yeah, I, I, I appreciate you for, for doing that. Like all of us here, you know, just, just sharing your story and being transparent and letting people know, like Miss April said, letting people know that there is life after abuse you can overcome, we can overcome so many things. There are so many amazing, strong people on this showcase tonight. Like, I, I don't think I, we could have picked a better showcase tonight. Everyone on here is amazing and is strong, overwhelmingly strong. <laughs> um, and I'm just so proud of everybody. Um, uh, Machina, what do you have that you have going on right now? What are, what's your goals right now? Where do you work? <laughs> well, I dropped the project movie for domestic violence actually in October, which is called Through Your Eyes. So I have that going on. And I actually just, I was in a contest and I actually just won Global African Fashion Face Piece of World 2021. So I am about to do that title as well. I have a, um, combination poetry book that I'm coming out with with other people in January. And um, I have an event actually Thursday that I'm doing for domestic violence and I'm on a podcast. I write for a magazine. I blog for somebody else. Um, I'm on another podcast that I do Tuesday and Thursdays, which is called Word for the Heart on Feel Good Talk. So I pretty much promote, advocate, and I have my own brand, which is called Sheena Master Motivation. So whereas I do motivational speaking, seminars, workshops, mentorship, I got my life coaching. So I do the one-on-ones there and I do market bridging. Goodness, I'm tired <laughs> of just listening to that resume. <laughs> so I'm, I'm gonna ask you this question. How do you balance all of that? You have a lot going on. I thought I had a lot going on. Well, you have a lot going you know, on. I get that same question. <laughs> a lot of times I wake up and I, I, I understand what my purpose is and everything that I do, I do and I get the letters and I get the, the information and people tell me how much my words are empowering to them and inspiring. Mm -hmm. So I take that as my motivation to do whatever it is through the pain because honestly, I wake up every day and I'm in pain constantly. So I don't think about the pain. I think about how I heal people. So I use my story as my stars for a story for other people to heal them through the process. So that's my motivation. And God wakes me up and gives me the energy. So whatever he gives me the energy for, why not? Let's do it. Very nice. Very nice. And did I, did I hear you say, you said something, was it a, a play? A, there was something that you said otherwise in a book that you had. Um, uh, you talking about the project that I did the movie? Yes, yes. Tell us about that. <laughs> okay. Um, that was actually shot during COVID. I did it in July and we dropped it in October, but it is basically a group of individuals that we got together for them to tell their individual survival stories. Men, women, me. I had my daughter in there so she can tell from her side and just basically give the information and let people understand that, like I said, it it trickles down. It's not the only person that it affects when you're just harming that one person. You're harming a lot of different things around this cycle. So it's more to just give a different look into it from girls, guys, kids, and everything else. So it's called Through Your Eyes. It's on YouTube, Roku, and Amazon Fire. Very nice. Very nice. And that that's really important. When I started the Speak Up and Inspire series, um, it was to give a platform to survivors to be able to share their stories. Um, so I always love it when I hear that this is something that is also, you know, going on elsewhere. I'm sure I knew I wasn't the original person of it. So, but it's nice to be able to see other platforms taking place of survivors being able to share their stories because that's the whole thing. We would speak up and inspire, speak up, share your story, let people know what you've been through so that you can help others and inspire others. So I definitely appreciate you sharing that with us. Is there anything? else you'd like to share with us Miss Sheena um I think I shared it all I mean I can show you the preview cover of my last book this is the cover nice yeah I was just sharing your other cover which well, was on the back of the wall <laughs> yeah I see that so this is the mask behind the I'm sorry the mask behind the mask and this was your first book correct yes correct 
That was your first book. And so that's on the screen right now for everybody who wants to take a peek real quick. So when you're looking forward, you know what to look for. And then if you can put that up so we can see the other cover. This is the recent that actually just released this November 22nd. Um, Very nice. For my birthday. Very nice. Unveiled. Unveiled. Yeah, it was a great way to ce celebrate my 40th. I couldn't go nowhere, so why not release the book? Okay, welcome to the 40 Club, girlfriend. Hey. <laughs> nice very nice well thank you so much Machina, for sharing um i said earlier because we have one more guest miss belinda i said earlier that the guests that were on um and watching that i'm going to be giving away everyone's book at first i said only the ones in front of me but i'm not going to do that i'm giving away everyone's book so if i don't have it in front of me right now i'm going to get it and make sure I give those books out as well. So we're giving away, how many we have? Nine tonight? Nine free books. So I will be announcing those after we talk to Miss Doll Hollywood, Miss Belinda. How you doing, girl? <laughs> I'm trying to stay hey, high. What's popping, what's popping? <laughs> hello, Miss Belinda. Last, hello, hello. Last but not least, Miss Belinda. What's going on out here? <laughs> I to stay out of trouble. I need somebody to come get these twins over here. <laughs> I'll tell you these twins over here is a handful, girl. I can't take it. <laughs> um, I have two of your books here. So we have um, your first book, Take Off the Mask. And you are, yes. you are on the cover, looking beautiful as ever. Take Off the Thank Mask. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Belinda Houston. When I tell you that this is a diva, Y'all, this is a diva, Miss Belinda. Miss Belinda. <laughs> and then her second book that just came out. When did this come out? Last month, right? Yes. That's okay. Month. Marriage, Secrets, and Lovers. This is the one I can't wait to open up because it sounds like it's got a whole lot of drama going on. <laughs> oh, how about that? How about that? <laughs> All right, Miss Belinda. Tell us who Miss Belinda is. What do the readers need to know about you? Well. Belinda is a mother of two of Christopher. Well, let me change that. Dante and Kaylin. Um, I have five grandbabies, um, Javon and Miracle, and a set of twins, and um, which is um, Aaliyah and Akila, and my goddaughter, um, Zen. And um, I'm just fun. I'm, very straight to the point. Yes, you are. I ain't sugarcoat nothing. No, you don't. You either love me or like me because I have no room for hate. Okay. <laughs> so um <laughs> I am a national doll agent for Elite Dolls of Faith. I'm also the president of the Queen City Dolls um here in Charlotte, North Carolina. I'm also um, a board member of Butterfly Vision. <laughs> and um, I'm also um, the founder of God's Gift Baby Ministry. So I wear a lot of hats and I do a lot of things. And another thing, I just co-authored with um, Angela Thomas Smith and um, um, women of... Wait a minute, I need my glasses on. Look, you know, I can't really see that good. I'm just being being serious. Because half the time I can't see. Most of the time I can't pronounce something straight. <laughs> so it's uh women of and then if mm, now look, now I'm getting tongue twisted. It's okay, take your time. <laughs> Here you go. Here go the book. Okay, I can't I can't see it, Miss Belinda. Put y'all put it up so I can see it. <laughs> okay. Uh women of I can't see it. Put it up a little bit more. Oh, she said put it up a little bit more. Can you not see? You need it, your black yeah, stuff. Okay. Women of indefinable. Is that faith? Is that what it is? Yeah, indefinable word. Gotcha. Gotcha. I <laughs> am owning, I am owning my own truth. And that I do. I own my own truth. So take off the mask is about things that I endured in my life. 
like um, the hate that I had for my father that I no longer have anymore. Um, it talks about um, my past relationships. Um, it also um, has featured my son. Um, if you can see through my eyes, which my son is, um, he has a disability. He, he is speech impairment, but he's functioning. He's functional. And I talk about the drug addiction that um, I had and all of this is in poetry. So things that I wanted to say, um, I get to say it. So now I really get to say the things that I want to say because <laughs> I have taken up all my masses. I have nothing to hide anymore. So if you don't want to know something, don't come ask me. <laughs> Because I'm going to tell you the truth, okay? <laughs> so, um, Marriage Lovers and Secrets is the sequel to Take Off the Mask. Because I'm leaving a legacy for my babies, for my grandbabies. Mm -hmm. So, people don't have to come and tell them what they, what they know about their grandmama. So that's just like when, see, Miracle is 12. So on down the road, she meets somebody and they say, oh, my grandmama says she knew your, your grandmama and your grandmama was a crackhead. Well, yeah, she was. We read about it. She told us all about it. We read about it. So tell us something that we don't know. <laughs> so they're not going to be able to come and tell my grandkids things about me because all of them are going to have a book. And what I don't share with the older ones now, you know, they'll get to read. The young ones don't know anything, so they'll get to read. I might not be here, but they'll get to read and know everything they need to know about me so no one has to tell them. Yes, your, yes, your nanny was a whole lot of fool. <laughs> but I love my babies. I take care of my grandkids. I love spending, I've been with my grandkids for two weeks now. <laughs> so I haven't even went home yet. I've been going home for the last week and ain't went yet. But I love being me. I love sharing my story because can nobody tell my story better than me? Yes, ma'am. So I don't have no reason to hide nothing. So marriage, lovers, and secrets goes into my marriage. And um, Mr. was a good man, a God-fearing man. But I jumped the fence. I jumped the fence. When I say I jumped the fence, I jumped the fence. I jumped the fence to the women's side over there and enjoyed very much. <laughs> but, you know, the more of the story is that it connects me and my ex-husband back together to raise our two grandchildren. Mm -hmm. So it ain't about what all me... It, what me and him went through is what me and him overcame together to provide. Because when most relationships, they separate, divorce, like y'all say, it's the kids that get hurt, the grandkids, they don't get to see. Well, no, it wasn't like that with us. It was like that for a minute, but we had to come together to do something. And, and that's what we done. So dealing with the other half, the women, they just as crazy as men. <laughs> you, go through, you go through that stuff. But who did you all that with me? What's your question, Tiffany? What no, is I, I was agreeing with you, Miss Miss Belinda. Oh, now. <laughs> yes, they crazy. They just as crazy. But um look at look at Sheena. Out my Throughout the things that I went through with these women, we all seem to have something in common. 
Well, they had something in common. They was <laughs> they was all the black sheep of their family. Okay. And it was always a drug issue. Hmm. So when I decided that I wasn't going to get high anymore, I haven't been high, and it's been seven years that I've been free. Good for you. Of crack cocaine. And able to talk about it, love it, and I don't walk around with lesbian written across my forehead for you to figure out if I am one or not. <laughs> But I just know that I'm blessed. I thank God. And if it wasn't for so many people believing in me, I don't know where I would be. But the first thing that I can say, and she is on this on this um, <laughs> Facebook tonight, when I first met Precious Paula, <laughs> she said to me, she said, you know what? It's something about you. She said, you're going to go places. And she said, I'm going to be there to watch. And look, I never planned to be an author. <laughs> never in my wildest dreams thought that I would be an author. Mm -hmm. But I can say I am not where I used to be. And I thank God for that. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. You have, you go ahead and ask a question. Yes, you have a good um, testimony. You didn't really leave me with too many questions, Miss Belinda. <laughs> <laughs> But I do want to make some comments. So I, I told you before, and you know, I'll continue to tell you that I appreciate you. You're doing really big things in the community. You're helping a lot of women, especially single mothers um, in the community. So I want you to tell us about God's gift um, baby ministry, because that's a big part of, of what you do in the community. And I would like for everybody to, to hear about it. So can you tell us about God's gift baby ministry? Wonderful. Well, <laughs> I used to get mad when, you know, you hear about people doing stuff in the community, but you never hear them talk about what they're doing for the babies. And God laid it on my heart, and it's been two years now, to do something. So I started collecting baby items. And um, when I became the president of the Queen City Dolls, I got my dolls involved. <laughs> so we started collecting baby items. We wash them. We separate them. And we go out into in the community. And we do a God's Gift Baby Giveaway where they come and they get what ever they want we have um been to charlotte gastonia Durham. we travel so um i don't make it just um a queen city you know a charlotte area you know i try to we try to go everywhere and um we're getting ready to be on the move and i'm excited about it and um, my organization, um, Elite Dolls of Faith, we are getting the darling, darling babies. You know, we're going to um, join them together. So we're going to be headed to Atlanta and Virginia. And yeah, we're getting ready to go nationwide, the globe. We're getting ready to really travel. We're getting ready to help these ladies out. And if y'all know anyone that needs anything for their babies, please um, hit me up on Facebook, God's Gift Baby Ministry, or you can get in touch with um, Miss Tiffany because she can get in touch with me quicker too. 
Mm-hmm. And um, any donations, baby items, trust me. Call me, I'm coming to get them. <laughs> okay. Definitely. Um, uh, Miss Belinda, you've helped several um, moms that we've referred to you. Um, you're on the BVP board, um, which is my, organ- my organization that works with victims of domestic violence and sexual assault. Um, so you're, you're doing really good things in the community. And your book is definitely one that is, again, transparent, like everyone is on, on tonight. Transparent, real, raw. Like uh, Miss T, very raw. Said, very raw. <laughs> um, very raw. And we really, we really learn a lot about you, but we also learn how you have overcome so many obstacles in your life. So, everyone, if you're looking for a book filled with drama and suspense and realness and rawness and all that, all that good stuff, make sure you check out both "Take Off the Mask" and her new book, "Marriage Secrets and Lovers." Um, definitely um, you can learn a very big lesson about co-parenting and doing what you need to do to raise your children, definitely, um, with her new book. So we are going to wrap it up. We have gone over, way over. (laughs) So I'm so happy that everybody stayed on. Um, We've had people that have stayed on the whole time watching. um, So I'm very, very happy about that. The next author showcase we're going to be doing is going to be in February, March. So now I'm going to make sure it's two hours, not an hour and a half. (laughs) So we're going to go ahead. I'm not even going to talk about my book. My book is Reality Check. It's basically based on um, my true life experiences as a sexual assault survivor. Um, It's based on true life events, but I've given my true experiences to fictional characters that I've built based on people that have been in my life that were supportive in my life. Um, It's a page turner. I'm not just saying it because it's mine. It's going off the reviews. Um, It has a lot going on in it. Um, full of drama it has a, a love story it ends with the love story um, and definitely make sure that you check it out reality check you can find it on my website uh, tiffanylbrown.com if you want to learn more about it just hit me up I'm not going to hold us any longer talking about myself so let's go ahead and give away some of these books all right so um, let's do this now so, Miss um, Chrissy Edwards, Miss Chrissy Edwards, you are going to get Miss Belinda Houston's book, uh, Take Off the Mask. Miss Chrissy Edwards, if you are still on, um, I will be reaching out to everybody if you have dropped off. So, Miss Chrissy Edwards, you're going to be getting Miss Belinda Houston's book, Take Off the Mask. Put that right there. Yay, All right. Yay Miss Chrissy, Miss Chrissy, let me see. I'm trying not to hold people up, but I want to make sure people hear their name. So, Miss Chrissy. Uh, nope, she must. Have, we're not friends. Okay, I'll contact y'all later. Okay, so the next <laughs> winner is going to be of uh, Miss Sheena's book, which is the mask behind the mask. That is going to be going to the beautiful Miss Sheena Gibson. Miss Sheena Gibson. I had to check it. That's not you, is it, Sheena? Okay, okay. So she No, popped. that's my homegirl. We call her Sheena number two. So oh, okay. She's she part of my mom? tribe. She just makes sure, you know, everything goes smoothly, if anything, you know. She... Okay, does she have your book already? Do no. I need Okay, good. Okay, okay, good. All right, so Miss Sheena um, is going to be getting the mask behind the mask. So congratulations to Miss Sheena. Watch out, Heaven. Um, next, we have... Um, Miss Tammy Thomas. Miss Tammy Thomas, her book is Life Through Poetry's Eyes. The winner of this is Miss Kay Hennett. So I believe that's Miss Mr. Dwayne's wife. So Miss Kay Hennett is going to get Life Through Poetry's Eyes. Um, Miss Kay, thank you for always supporting your hubby and answering people's questions on the thread. I really appreciate that. Um, thank you so much. That's, that's, that's a big deal. That's a big deal standing behind your man, girl. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so Miss Kay Hennett is getting life through poetry's eyes by Miss Tammy Thomas. 
Our next book is Miss T. Wallflower. I do not have hers, but I will get it from her. Miss T. Wallflower, her book is, oh my God, don't let me forget. Um, Miss Tammy, tell me the name of, of her book. I don't have it written down, sorry. Let me look. Let me look. Sorry, I thought I had a mute. A bee, it's a bee's trap and it's own honey. Yes, yes. That's the one that's got a whole lot of drama going on. Yeah. Um, you're not gonna know what's going on until you get to the end. <laughs> right. So you want to make sure that you 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 read that. And um, that is going to Miss Chrissy Richards. Miss Chrissy Richards. Our next book is Mr. Dion's book. And he is, okay, Failure is Not an Option. Failure is Not an Option, that's the name of his book. That is going to Miss Lakeisha Steele. Miss Lakeisha Steele, mm -hmm. you have won Mr. Dion Wingate's book, Failure is Not an Option. Our next one is Miss Nicole Williams. Your book, I don't have it in front of me. It is A Butterfly Called Rainbow, Five Books of Poetic Healing. The winner of that is the beautiful and my sister, Miss Katrina Thomas. Miss Katrina Thomas is gonna be getting a copy of A Butterfly Called Rainbow, Five Books of Poetic Healing. I know Katrina is going to love, 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 love your book, Miss Nicole. Y'all have met before, so I made sure I picked her for that. Okay. <laughs> um, so we have two more books. Mr. Uh, Dwayne Hennett, your book is going to Miss Melissa Price. She specifically asked where to find your book. So Mr. Miss Melissa Price is going to be getting the ripple effect. Why, why are you shaking your hand? She got your book already? She does? Okay. She just, bought, she just bought it. <laughs> oh, she just bought it? Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Let me see. I'm going to go. I'll come back to that. So, Miss Melissa Price, I, I had it for you. <laughs> but she can pay it forward. She can pay it forward. Okay, we can do that. Thank you, Precious. That's what we're going to do. So I don't have to go looking back. Miss Melissa Price, you can pay it forward. Thank you, Miss Precious. <laughs> so Miss Melissa Price is going to be getting that. And last but not least is Miss April. Pinpoints of light. Pinpoints of light. That is going to be going. No, I have one more, Precious. That is going to be going to um, Aaron Wilkerson. Aaron Wilkerson is going to be getting... Pinpoints of Light by Miss April. And our last book is going to go to, hold on. All right, so doing a round of applause. Let's see. So for Miss Precious, her book, How Special Are You? Well, you're one of a kind. This one right here is going to be going to, uh, I'm letting it go. I'm letting it go. And that one is going to Miss Nima. Miss Nima Shining Star L. Miss Nima Shining Star L is going to get Miss Precious's book. How special are you? Well, you're one of a kind. Miss Precious, my daughter is trying to take this book right now. So <laughs> yes. <laughs> I had to snatch it from her. All right, so thank you everybody for coming on tonight, for bearing with us. We had some technical difficulties that put us behind and we ran over, but it's all good because we got through everybody. Everybody got to talk about their book. We gave away some books. Um, please make sure that you share um, this interview tonight. Make sure you post your links in the comments. Um, the first one, so there is a, a thread that has 151 comments. That's the one you want to put your links on, okay? To all of our authors, the one that has the most comments on it is the one you need to put your links on so that everybody can find your books. Thank you everybody for um, joining us for the first author showcase with the Speak Up and Inspire series. The next one will be between February and March. If you are an author, you want to be featured, reach out to me. And I promise we're going to have a good time like we did tonight. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And I appreciate you all. Have a good night. Good night.
All right. Good night. Good night. Good night.